right. Next up on our spectacular Cracker Jack lineup is Alana. <laughs> so Alana is going to talk to us a little bit about documentation, which is always pretty exciting. And Alana's favorite Animal Crossing neighbor is Bunny. And hard agree, Bunny is very cute. So everyone, please give a very warm Animal Crossing Twitch welcome to Alana Burke. I just want to give a, a, a quick note. If you hear any squeaking in the background, uh, that's not coming from Animal Crossing. That is actually coming from the guinea pigs in my office uh, who will use any excuse that they have to tell the world that they are starving. Worry not, they are not starving, they're fine. <laughs> so um, I want to talk today about how to keep up with documentation when you work on an agile team, as so many of us do who work in DevOps. I want to talk a little bit first about me. Um, again, my name is Alana Burke. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I work at Amazee.io, which is a hosting company. Um, we have a product, Lagoon, which is our open source um, deployment tool. So while our primary focus is supporting our customers, we, uh, we're also developing the product that helps us support them. Uh, we have a small team, just 30 people, including several folks that we kind of share across our sister companies. We have about a dozen engineers and me, the documentation writer. So I am responsible for all of the documentation with a focus on our public facing customer talks. Um, and my background is about 10 years in web development. I have a BS in information science and technology, but interestingly, like Chloe, I also started uh, a career in theater. Um, although I left musical theater in high school and started doing technical theater, um, and I worked quite a bit as a professional stage manager, um, which is kind of fun. So. Keeping up with the pace of an Agile team can be really, really tough, and it depends very, very heavily on how your team works, but I've come up with some things that I think can translate to any situation. So one of the first things is to invite yourself. So sometimes the docs writer can get excluded from the more technical team meetings. Invite yourself to them. You might find out that you don't need to be there all the time, but make that decision for yourself. Be accessible. So one of the ways that I've tried to make myself accessible as the team's documentation writer and to give our team dedicated spaces to discuss and look at our docs is by making spaces inside of the resources that we already use. Um, so we have a dedicated Slack channel just for documentation related discussion, which has been super helpful. Uh, I also have a JIRA board that shows every ticket that's been tagged documentation or is in our documentation epic. So that way, even if a ticket wasn't created by me or assigned to me, I can still keep track of it if it's related to documentation. Be flexible. I'm often juggling multiple projects at once in addition to speaking. And what I plan to do for the week on Monday is often not what I wind up getting done on Friday. But as long as I'm doing what the team needs to get done and what helps our customers and our company, that's fine with me. I have a plan for what I want to get done, but there's also a lot of things moving and shifting at once. And it's important not to be too rigid in your planning so that you can't adapt. It's also helpful to have a process. So how your team works from tickets to delivery can make this easier on you as the documentation writer. If your project manager writes good user stories, these stories can inform what you need to write and document along with what the engineers need to build. Be collaborative. There's a lot of different ways that I work with the folks on my team to get the information that I need to document. Sometimes they talk through it themselves and send me a video to work from. Sometimes we have a call together I often have folks write up a Google Doc that we finalize together, and then I move that into our documentation. 
And then others just give me basics and bullet points and I go from there. The main thing is trying to work with each team member in a way that suits them. Things tend to move quickly and no one on my team is ever not busy. So I want to get what I need from folks in a way that lets me do my work, but also works for their daily workflow. And again, in terms of process, sprints can be your friend. Sometimes I feel overwhelmed by how much there is to document. I think I could work here forever and still find things to document. Um, I was at Write the Docs earlier this week and there was a lot of talk about, um, you know, things being complete but never finished. Um, so I think following a sprint helps to prioritize and give you discrete chunks of work to tackle um, so that you don't feel like you're constantly working on something without ever having it be complete. Another challenge when it comes to, oh, did I, did that go right? Okay. Another uh, challenge when it comes to documentation is being aware of changes before they happen. Ideally, some of the tips that we've just gone over will help to keep you in the loop, but it won't always, so we can do more. My next tip is to monitor everything. First, keep an eye on pull requests and instruct that any PRs that are changing documentation or adding to documentation be assigned to you or your docs team. But unfortunately, that relies on humans to tell you what they're doing, and that's not always reliable either. So far, here are some of the best ways that I found to stay on top of things. Attend product team standups to be aware of current and incoming changes. Have regular calls with the product owner. Luckily for me, the product owner is my manager, so we're always having one-on-ones. Skim the relevant Slack channels. These may be channels that you don't actively participate, but only lurk in. Again, invite yourself. Give yourself permission to participate in them. If engineers are discussing a major change that you've never heard about, say, hey, when is that scheduled to roll out? Do we have a ticket for that? Are there docs? Find out. There's this sort of historical idea of tension between doc teams and engineering teams. And a huge part of tearing down that divide to me is remembering that we're all peers on the same team working towards the same goal. The main idea here is to find out where changes are being talked about and put yourself there. Sometimes I feel like a broken record on my team, but I'm always popping up somewhere to say, hey, do we need docs for that? Has that been documented? Do you need me to write up docs for that? But if it exists, it should be documented. And so I ask. This next one is what inspired me to write this talk. Being diplomatic when breaking changes are introduced. Sometimes you're going to miss things. Something will be merged when you're asleep or sick or on vacation, or you'll just be merrily working away and suddenly notice that things aren't working. So what do you do? A couple of things happened recently that caused some links and media in our documentation to break. And while my initial instinct was to be annoyed, I kept my cool while we figured out what happened. The first incident was that we changed our default branch from master to main. I knew that this was happening, but I didn't know when the button was going to be pressed. Unfortunately, when the button was pressed, a lot of links broke and I had no idea it happened. And someone on another team came to me and said, hey, this documentation is all broken. And I was super embarrassed. So after fixing it, I resolved to implement measures to keep that from happening again. At about the same time, a handful of YouTube videos that I created to supplement our documentation broke as well. Our marketing team handles those, and it turned out they had updated the intros and outros to the videos, but instead of replacing the same YouTube video, they deleted the old ones and updated new ones. I was really not happy about this, especially as those videos had been used and shared in various places already. But I knew that our marketing team was just trying to make us look good, so we talked and I explained why the URLs needed to stay the same and requested that any other changes to documentation related content get run by me first. It can be really hard not to be irritated when things break and it makes you look bad. Documentation is my domain at our company. I own it, I'm responsible for it. And when things are out of my control, I don't really like it. 
But I know that at the end of the day, we're all working towards the same goal. So if this happens to you, take a minute. If you know that you can be a little hot-headed or snippy, don't talk about it right away. Walk around the block, have a snack, then come back and calmly discuss it. If you're remote, it might help to hop on a video chat. Text can be hard, especially when you're, if you're tense, it can be easier to talk it out in person and make sure that you don't actually accidentally say something that's taken in a way you didn't mean. Let's talk about some technical solutions to help keep track of changes and problems in your docs. Like I said, lurk in engineering channels, even if you're not in them. Go through your company Slack and see where people are talking about things. Use your issue tracking software to keep an eye on all things documentation related. Have a dedicated channel in your chat client to discuss docs. Set up notifications in GitHub or your version control software so that you can see new pull requests. Use linters to check for things like broken links. There are differing schools of thoughts when it comes to having external links in your docs because you can't control that URL. I prefer to be able to refer to other information and documentation, so we now use a linter to check for broken links. This also helps us keep track of internal links. Even on a small team, we may be moving or renaming repositories or branches that we point to, and this enables us to make sure that we're never pointing to broken links. Again, the main idea here is to find the technical spaces where the decisions are being made and where you can see what's going on and watch those spaces. Find the way that works best for you. Your workflow and day is going to look different from the days of your engineers and your project managers and product owners, but where you overlap is where you can find out what is going on and stay on top of things. How to prioritize when you have to catch up to changes. Sometimes you are going to fall behind or find out that there have been code or functionality changes without documentation changes, but don't panic. Ask yourself a couple of questions and then proceed. Is anything broken? Do they need to change any settings in order to continue using the product as they were? Has anything been changed that the customers need to know about right now? If not, then it's not an emergency. Don't lose sleep over it. Update it as soon as you possibly can. When it comes to documentation, the minimum viable product is what you're aiming to publish immediately. Get the steps that the user needs to use your product. If they're going to need steps to install and configure it, then get those steps up. If there's a complex configuration in order to start using it, get that information live quickly. The other details can wait. Another helpful thing that I found when it comes to prioritizing work in general is ensuring that we are able to track the search terms used by people inside of our documentation. The solution that we use offers a fairly robust search and I can review what those terms were every week or month and know what our users are most looking for inside of our documentation. So that allows me to focus on adding or improving items in those categories. Organizing your odds and ends. So don't make more work for yourself. I write a lot. I write internal docs, customer facing docs, sets of docs that are delivered to customers. I have notes, bits of docs, half written docs, presentations, abstracts, you name it. But it's all completely perfectly organized both on Google Drive and in my computer and in my handwritten notebook. So if somebody asks about something, I can find it. I title and date everything. There's no untitled documents floating around in my Google Drive. So if it exists, I can find it and search for it. I never have to write something over that I know I've written because I can't find it. So take the time to keep everything organized and searchable so that you don't have to do your work more than once. Finally, 
release notes. Here we can make our process work for us. In an ideal world, you've already been writing good user stories, commit messages, pull requests, so you shouldn't have much left to write. This is also something you can make easier with templates. If you template everything, you can collect all of the information from your PRs, your commits, your user stories, and that should give you what you need for your release notes. Collect this information, make it useful, and make it readable. If the information in your release notes isn't useful and human readable, why would you bother with them? There's no need to write a long, clever paragraph, but do give your users actual information. What issues have you closed? What security threats have you addressed? What bugs have you fixed? What documentation have you written? So that was a lot in a short talk, um, but one resource that I used very heavily while um, working on this talk was The Product is Docs, which I think is a really fantastic book um, if you interact with documentation at all. Um, it was written by Christopher Gales and the Splunk documentation team. I highly recommend it. I got a ton out of this book um, and still reference it occasionally. Um, and again, I know that was a ton of information in a short talk. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them in the speaker Q&A or on Twitter at aberk626. So thank you. Oh my gosh, that was so much useful information, Alana. <laughs> Everyone, give a shout out to Alana in the Twitch chat, in the Discord, everywhere. So that, you know, we document how much we loved that talk in as many places as possible. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I heard any of the little guineas in the background, but I was, I kind of wanted to, but oh my gosh, I, I wrote down a lot just because first of all, I would like to say to you, Alana, that these, that your slides were very, very good. And like, just as someone who sometimes has trouble following along with slides, these were so well um, like sectioned off and easy to follow and Man, just A plus on the slides, loved them. And also I really liked the note that you meant about being really intentional with language, whether it's the docs you're writing in the first place or your response to other people. I think sometimes um, that can be really hard to remember for folks. Thank you. Yeah, and let me check. Okay, can, uh, are you okay with a question on air? I'll do one for you. Oh, absolutely. Okay, how does your team do commit messages? Do you have a process or do you do conventional commits? Uh, do you have any, any feelings there? Oh, um, we have a pretty standard template that we just have in GitHub that comes up and asks you, you know, uh, what is this commit for? What is it closing? What is it doing? What does it address? Um, it asks a fair amount of questions that not everybody fills out, um, sure. but if you do fill them all out, it gives you a pretty nice long commit message. Same with our pull requests. Um, and, uh, or wait, I'm thinking of pull requests. Yeah, um, commit messages. I think we just, we have a general process of like put a useful commit message, um, right. the standard, and then our pull requests have a template. That's fair. I mean, I personally, as someone, so in a previous life, I was a writer. And templates are so helpful. Um, they really make your, your team more at ease with like, you know, people who maybe aren't accustomed to like paying as much attention to their, the way that they write a template, I think can make the process a lot easier for them. Yeah, and the it, it can feel scary and complicated if you've never put like a GitHub template in there before, but it's mm -hmm. it's not that hard to do. There is documentation. And once you do it, you're like, oh my God, my life is changed. How did I live without these? So if you don't <laughs> have any, if you've never put GitHub templates to work before, I highly recommend it. Oh my gosh. And when you said you had no untitled docs in your Google Drive, I was feeling pretty attacked. Okay. <laughs> As someone who repeatedly <laughs> has to open them and be like, what is this? And then it will just, sometimes it'll be nothing or it'll be like one word that I never <laughs> finished writing. I See, am. I used to be that person and I was just like, I can't be this person anymore. I just, I can't be. <laughs> yeah, it totally makes sense. And 
I don't know about everyone else here, but I'm probably going to be uh, making sure that your talk goes back to my team so that we can all <laughs> really, really make sure. Everyone, one more time, please thank Alana. Give it up in the chat, in the Discord, and everywhere in between. Thank you, Alana.